To illustrate the kind of as-built documentation that CodeCrew can provide, we're going to look at a little program that implements a relatively famous scenario called the Dining Philosophers Scenario, where you have five philosophers around a round table and five forks, and one of them sits down and eats some spaghetti using a fork on the right and a fork on the left, and then after eating the spaghetti for a while, gets up and walks around and thinks again. Then another philosopher sits down, and there's a famous synchronization problem where if uh, two philosophers sit down and they both want to eat at the same time and they're next to each other, then there's a little bit of a race condition about who gets that fork in the middle. And this is a uh, simple implementation of this. So we're going to uh, first take a look at the, the source code here. Here's the, uh, the implementation in Ada, if you will, of a dining philosopher. We have a fork, which is a shared protected object. And we have a philosopher represented as an instance of this type person. And then we have a busboy whose job is to clean up. And uh, the way we create this scenario is we create a number of different philosophers. Here are their names and the forks on either side of them and so on. At the begin point here, the various eta tasks that have been spawned start running. And the philosophers compete for the forks and while well, they're not thinking and so on. Anyway, it's a, it's a fun little example. We're going to use it here to look into the as-built documentation, and then we're later going to look at it from the point of view of race conditions, which is another advanced feature of CodePeer that we'll talk about later. Okay, here's our source code, and with CodePeer, all we need to do is click on the Analyze All button, and it will, in the background, run the CodePeer static analysis tool. And when it's all done, it will pop up this summary that shows us the number of different levels of messages, the high ranking, the medium ranking, and the low ranking messages that have been found. Down below here, we'll see a summary of the various messages, 10 in the diningphilosophers.adb source file, five in this one. And we also have some race conditions, which we'll talk about later. So now let's look into the individual messages, and we see various messages relating to race conditions. And we also see some range checks and so on. And, and we've been through some of these individual messages in our earlier videos. But at this point, I want to actually look at the source code itself. So let's just pick an arbitrary message and go in and take a look at the source code. Let's say this one. And here it pops up the source code for the Dining Philosophers source file. And the thing to notice here is that there are some comments in gray, highlighted in gray, that looks like we didn't write. There are no line numbers associated with them. So this is some of the as-built documentation that I've described CodePeer is very nicely producing for us. And uh, there, for each of the different subprograms and for each of the tasks and so on, this will provide us with information about what are the net effects of this component. What does it have in the way of limitations? Those would be our preconditions. What does it uh, have in the way of postconditions? It's, it's net effects. And then also we mentioned things like presumptions, global inputs, global outputs, and so on. Here we have, for example, the task body for the type person, the task type person. And we'll see that we're learning that this task body reads various globals, writes various globals, has some preconditions which are not terribly interesting for us because they have to do with internal objects within the ADA runtime model that reference to the task should not be null, and there's a lock that should be initialized, and so on. And when we're all done, when the task body is complete, we know that this counter global has been initialized. We know that the still eating global is less than the integer tick last minus one. Before we get too much into the details of this, this as-built documentation, it's useful to take a look at the specification for this, uh, this package. So let's go over to the spec file, and uh, let's ignore all of these 
all this as-built documentation for a moment and look at the various types that we're dealing with. There is this protected type fork, which is a protected object, and we will be having five instances of them. And we notice that it has a couple of private data per fork that tells you whether the fork has been seized and whether the fork has been cleaned and so on. Then we have this task type person. We have one of these instances of these for every philosopher. And the, one of the key points is that when these objects of this task type are created, they're going to be provided with a non-null reference to a fork object. So when we're inside the body of this task type, we're going to be see references to the various discriminants, and in this case, first and second are critical. So if we go back to our body here, we'll see that we do have some references to task.first seized, task.second seized, and so on. And what we're talking about here are the first and second fork that have been provided to the philosopher, presumably, let's say, his left and right hand fork. And the issue is that we're going to be seizing that fork and then releasing the fork. And by the time we're all done, the fork will be back to its initial state, which is unseized. So here we see the fork being grabbed, the first fork and the second fork. And here we see the forks being put down, the second fork and then the first fork. And this loops around for as long as the philosopher chooses to be part of this scenario uh, for up to their lifespan. We have a little de delay. We put out some messages. We have a, um, we grab the forks. We then delay during eating, and then we put the forks down, and then we loop around again. And finally, uh, when we're all done, we, we indicate that we're no longer eating, and we decrement this count. So uh, anyway, back to our as-built documentation. As we see, we have these various inputs. We also have the primitive, the discriminants, uh, first and second. And these are referred to as underscore task dot second and underscore task dot first, just as a way to imply it's this task's first uh, discriminant named first, this task discriminant named second, and then these are components of these uh, first and second forks. So they're basically telling us that when we're all done, the fork will either be in the same state it was when we came in. If, if our lifespan was very short, we wouldn't have any effect on the fork. Otherwise, we can be confident that when we're done with it, it will be false because we put it down. And putting it down will set C's back to false. So however long this loop runs, just when we finish, we will have left it false. So this is the kind of information that we get from CodePeer in terms of some of the requirements before we run this task body and the requirements afterwards. We also talked about these presumptions, and I'm not going to delve right into them yet because they're, they're sort of obscure uh, for this particular program. So let's look at some other ones here. Here we have the busboy, and what's a busboy's job? Well, they wait until the philosophers are done eating, and then they clean up. So they, they initialize still eating to the number of forks, and as long as someone is still eating, they just wait, and once everyone is done eating, they wash the forks. So they keep washing until there are no more dirty forks left. They initialize it to the number of forks, and they, they pick up a fork, they wash it, and then they are done with that fork and they put it back down. And so they keep going through this list until they're done washing the forks. So what are the overall inputs and outputs here? Well, clearly the inputs are the forks, the outputs are also the forks, and also these individual fields of the forks, the clean field and the seized field. And also there are a couple of globals. There's the global still eating and, and so forth. Now let's look at the actual test program, testdiningphilosophers.adb. This is the one that actually creates the various forks. It creates the various philosophers. And we're seeing there's some messages here. Well, why don't we first look at the as-built documentation? Uh, this is the, this procedure Fork ref, I'm sorry, this function fork ref, which is part of this uh, nested within this procedure, test dining philosophers. And these are the uh, as built documentation for this individual procedure. And what's this procedure's job? Well, you call it with an index, and it 
returns you a reference to the ith fork. So that's primarily what it's doing. And we keep track of how many of them we're creating. And then this is really just trying to cause trouble. We're trying to show that there's some dangers that when this fork ref counter gets up to anything that is a multiple of eight, that is mod eight equals zero, then we return null instead of the value that we want. And that's really just to, to cause trouble. <laughs> so each time we call fork ref, we bump a counter. And on the eighth call, we return a null pointer just, just to make trouble. And how does this trouble get shown? Well, it gets shown by these various error messages here. So these messages are in red, and the message error we're getting is that the we're passing in a zero, and the precondition, if we go and look at the precondition of forkref, we will see that it has a precondition that i must be in one to five. So we were sort of assuming that the forks were indexed zero to five, but in fact, the left fork for the first philosopher is actually forkref five. So this should have been a five instead of a zero. So sure enough, the error message that we're getting, if we click on that line, we'll see that it's array index check fails here, called a test on the requires i in 1.5. This is a case where the precondition, which was as built documentation, is also checked at the, every point of use. So here we're using fork ref of zero, and the, the precondition is what is checked at the point of usage. So that's why we are given this error. And we have a couple other errors here. This one is just a access check that requires that fork ref of four not equal null. And so why is it equaling null? If you count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, this is the eighth call on fork ref. And if we've noticed here, the eighth call is the one that returns a null. So code peer has actually been counting how many calls occur here. And this one is going to get a null back. And that's going to be a problem because the requirement, if we remember from the declaration of the task type person, was that it be passed a non-null reference to a fork. And so this one is a problem because it's returning null in this case. And that's not what is required of the first fork discriminant of this type person. And then this last one is back to a precondition failure high precondition range check failure on call to test any philosophers. So we have a precondition of fork ref counter less than or equal nine. And, and why is that? Well, if you'll notice, fork ref counter has been declared to be in the range zero to 10. And when we go in here, the first thing we do is we add one to it. So therefore, if it's greater than nine, i.e. if it's 10, then we'll end up with an overflow here. And again, this is code peer counting how many calls there were on fork ref, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That one gets the null. Nine, ten. This one gets the overflow. So this call on fork ref is going to fail because there's this precondition fork ref counter less than or equal to nine. And that is because if it's ten, then we're getting an overflow right here. So again, CodePeer has analyzed this routine and determined that it will fail if fork ref counter is greater than nine. And that causes trouble because we actually need to call it 10 times. So there are a number of things that CodePeer is figuring out by just analyzing this, creating this as-built documentation. Another thing here that's useful is look at the post conditions. Well, what kind of things does it return? Well, the fork ref counter goes up by one. Afterwards, we know it's at least one because it's, it's in the range zero to 10 and we add one to it. So we know that it's, it's at least one or more. And the actual value returned is either null in this funny case when fork ref counter is eight after the increment, or it's going to be the actual value we really want. So there are a lot of things that you can learn just from looking at the post conditions that in particular here, it can return null, which is a little bit of a surprise until we look at the code and we can see, well, it was intentionally done that way to, to create some trouble. So. The combination of this as-built documentation, all these checks being performed by CodePeer on each use of the, every call on this function allows us to find a number of errors that you wouldn't normally find until you actually ran the program. So again, CodePeer is doing a lot of analysis that would allow you to find bugs before you actually run the program. So now we're going to go back to the presentation that we had ongoing about CodePeer and 
we'll come back to this example to look at our race condition errors after we talk a little bit about the race condition capabilities of code pair.